Chapter 4 Well, three or four months run along and it was well into the winter now. I had been to school most all the time and could spell and read and write just a little and could say the multiplication table up to 6 times 7 is 35 and I don't reckon I could ever get any further than that if I was to live forever. I don't take no stock in mathematics anyway. At first I hated the school but by and by I got so I could stand it. Whenever I got uncommon tired I played hooky and the hiding I got next day done me good and cheered me up. So the longer I went to school the easier it got to be. I was getting sort of used to the widow's ways, too, and they weren't so raspy on me. Living in a house and sleeping in a bed pulled on me pretty tight mostly but before the cold weather I used to slide out and sleep in the woods sometimes and so that was a rest to me. I liked the old ways best but I was getting so I liked the new ones too, a little bit. The widow said I was coming along slow but sure and doing very satisfactory. She said she weren't ashamed of me. One morning I happened to turn over the salt cellar at breakfast. I reached for some of it as quick as I could to throw over my left shoulder and keep off the bad luck, but Miss Watson was in ahead of me and crossed me off. She says, take your hands away, Huckleberry, what a mess you are always making. The widow put in a good word for me but that weren't going to keep off the bad luck, I know that well enough. I started out after breakfast, feeling worried and shaky, and wondering where it was going to fall on me and what it was going to be. There is ways to keep off some kinds of bad luck, but this wasn't one of them kind so I never tried to do anything but just poked along low, spirited and on the watch out. I went down to the front garden and clum over the stile where you go through the high board fence. There was an inch of new snow on the ground and I seen somebody's tracks. They had come up from the quarry and stood around the stile a while and then went on around the garden fence. It was funny they hadn't come in after standing around so. I couldn't make it out. It was very curious somehow. I was going to follow around but I stooped down to look at the tracks first. I didn't notice anything at first but next I did. There was a cross in the left boot heel made with big nails to keep off the devil. I was up in a second and shinning down the hill. I looked over my shoulder every now and then but I didn't see nobody. I was at Judge Thatcher's as quick as I could get there. He said. Why my boy you are all out of breath. Did you come for your interest? No sir AI says is there some for me? Oh yes a half yearly is in last night over a hundred and fifty dollars. Quite a fortune for you. You had better let me invest it along with your 6000 because if you take it you'll spend it. No sir I, I says I don't want to spend it. I don't want it at all nor the 6000 nother. I want you to take it I want to give it to you the 6000 and all. He looked surprised. He couldn't seem to make it out. He says why what can you mean my boy? I says don't you ask me no questions about it please. You'll take it won't you? He says, well I'm puzzled. Is something the matter? Please take it, says I, and don't ask me nothing, then I won't have to tell no lies. He studied a while and then he says, oh ho oh. I think I see. You want to sell all your property to me not give it. That's the correct idea. Then he wrote something on a paper and read it over and says, there, you see it says for a consideration. That means I have bought it of you and paid you for it. Here's a dollar for you. Now you sign it. So I signed it and left. Miss Watson's nigger, Jim, had a hairball as big as your fist, which had been took out of the fourth stomach of an ox and he used to do magic with it. He said there was a spirit inside of it and it knowed everything. So I went to him that night and told him Pap was here again, for I found his tracks in the snow. What I? wanted to know was what he was going to do and was he going to stay. Jim got out his hairball and said something over it and then he held it up and dropped it on the floor. It fell pretty solid and only rolled about an inch. Jim tried it again and then another time and it acted just the same. Jim got down on his knees and put his ear against it and listened. But it weren't no use he said it wouldn't talk. He said sometimes it wouldn't talk without money. 
I told him I had an old slick counterfeit quarter that weren't no good because the brass showed through the silver a little and it wouldn't pass no how even if the brass didn't show because it was so slick it felt greasy and so that would tell on it every time. I reckoned I wouldn't say nothing about the dollar I got from the judge. I said it was pretty bad money but maybe the hairball would take it because maybe it wouldn't know the difference. Jim smelt it and bit it and rubbed it and said he would manage so the hairball would think it was good. He said he would split open a raw Irish potato and stick the quarter in between and keep it there all night and next morning you couldn't see no brass and it wouldn't feel greasy no more and so anybody in town would take it in a minute, let alone a hairball. Well I know a potato would do that before but I had forgot it. C04-37.jpg 49k Jim put the quarter under the hairball and got down and listened again. This time he said the hairball was all right. He said it would tell my whole fortune if I wanted it to. I says go on. So the hairball talked to Jim and Jim told it to me. He says, yo old father don't know yet what he's agwine to do. Sometimes he spec he'll go way and den agin he spec he'll stay. The best way is to res easy and let the old man take his own way. Days two angels hover in rune bout him. One UVM is white and shiny and t'other one is black. The white one gets him to go right a little while den de black one sail in and bust it all up. A body can't tell yet which one gwine to fetch him at de loss. But you is all right. You gwine to have considable trouble in yo life and considable joy. Sometimes you gwine to get hurt and sometimes you gwine to get sick, but every time you's gwine to get well. Agin. Days two gals flyin' bout you in yo life. One UVM's light and t'other one is dark. One is rich and t'other is pu. You's gwine to marry de pu one fust and de rich one by and by. You wants to keep way from de water as much as you kin and don't run no resk, case it's down in de bills dat you's gwine to get hung. When I lit my candle and went up to my room that night there sat Pap his own self. Chapter V. I had shut the door to. Then I turned around and there he was. I used to be scared of him all the time he tanned me so much. I reckoned I was scared now too, but in a minute I see I was mistaken, that is after the first jolt, as you may say, when my breath sort of hitched, he being so unexpected, but right away after I see I weren't scared of him worth both ring about. He was most fifty and he looked it. His hair was long and tangled and greasy and hung down and you could see his eyes shining through like he was behind vines. It was all black no grey so was his long mixed up whiskers. There weren't no color in his face where his face showed it was white not like another man's white but a white to make a body sick a white to make a body's flesh crawl a tree toad white a fish belly white. As for his clothes just rags that was all. He had one ankle resting on t'other knee, the boot on that foot was busted, and two of his toes stuck through, and he worked them now and then. His hat was laying on the floor, an old black slouch with the top caved in, like a lid. I stood a looking at him, he sat there a looking at me with his chair tilted back a little. I set the candle down. I noticed the window was up so he had. Clum in by the shed. He kept a looking me all over. By and by he says, starchy clothes vary. You think you're a good deal of a big bug, don't you? Maybe I am, maybe I ain't, eh, I says. Don't you give me none o' oh, your lip, says he. You've put on considerable many frills since I been away. I'll take you down a peg before I get done with you. You're educated, too, they say, can read and write. You think you're better than your father now, don't you, because he can't? I'll take it out of you. Who told you you might meddle with such highfalutin foolishness, hey, who told you you could? The widow. She told me. The widow, hey, and who told the widow she could put in her shovel about a thing that ain't none of her business? Nobody never told her. Well, I'll learn her how to meddle. And looky here you drop that school you hear? I'll learn people to bring up a boy to put on airs over his own father and let on to be better than what he is. You let me catch you fooling around that school again you hear? Your mother couldn't read and she couldn't write nuther before she died. 
none of the family couldn't before they died. I can't and hear your ace swelling yourself up like this. I ain't the man to stand it, you hear? Say, let me hear you read. I took up a book and begun something about General Washington and the wars. When I'd read about a half a minute, he fetched the book a whack with his hand and knocked it across the house. He says, it's so. You can do it. I had my doubts when you told me. Now looky here, you stop that putting on frills. I won't have it. I'll lay for you, my smarty, and if I catch you about that school I'll tan you good. First you know you'll get religion, too. I never see such a son. He took up a little blue and yaller picture of some cows and a boy and says, what's this? It's something they give me for learning my lessons good. He tore it up and says, I'll give you something better, I'll give you a cowhide. He sat there a mumbling and a growling a minute and then he says, ain't you a sweet scented dandy though? A bed and bedclothes and a look and glass and a piece of carpet on the floor and your own father got to sleep with the hogs in the tan yard. I never see such a son. I bet I'll take some o' oh, these frills out o' oh, you before I'm done with you. Why, there ain't no end to your heirs, they say you're rich. Hey, how's that? They lie that's how. Looky here, mind how you talk to me, I may standing about all I can stand now so don't give me no sass. I've been in town two days and I hain't heard nothing but about you being rich. I heard about it away down the river too. That's why I come. You get me that money tomorrow, I want it. I hain't got no money. It's a lie. Judge Thatcher's got it. You get it. I want it. I hain't got no money, I tell you. You ask Judge Thatcher, he'll tell you the same. All right. I'll ask him and I'll make him pungle too or I'll know the reason why. Say how much you got in your pocket. I want it. I hain't got only a dollar and I want that too, it don't make no difference what you want it for, you just shell it out. He took it and bit it to see if it was good and then he said he was going downtown to get some whiskey said he hadn't had a drink all day. When he had got out on the shed he put his head in again and cussed me for putting on frills and trying to be better than him and when I reckoned he was gone he come back and put his head in again and told me to mind about that school because he was going to lay for me and lick me if I didn't drop that. Next day he was drunk and he went to Judge Thatcher's and bullyragged him and tried to make him give up the money, but he couldn't and then he swore he'd make the law force him. The judge and the widow went to law to get the court to take me away from him and let one of them be my guardian, but it was a new judge that had just come and he didn't know the old man so he said courts mustn't interfere and separate families if they could help it, said he'd drew their not take a child away from its father. So Judge Thatcher and the widow had to quit on the business. That pleased the old man till he couldn't rest. He said he'd cowhide me till I was black and blue if I didn't raise some money for him. I borrowed three dollars from Judge Thatcher and Pap took it and got drunk and went a blowing around and cussing and whooping and carrying on and he kept it up all over town with a tin pan till most midnight, then they jailed him and next day they had him before court and jailed him again for a week. But he said he was satisfied said he was boss of his son and he'd make it warm for him. When he got out the new judge said he was a going to make a man of him. So he took him to his own house and dressed him up clean and nice and had him to breakfast and dinner and supper with the family and was just old pie to him so to speak. And after supper he talked to him about temperance and such things till the old man cried and said he'd been a fool and fooled away his life. But now he was a going to turn over a new leaf and be a man nobody wouldn't be ashamed of and he hoped the judge would help him and not look down on him. The judge said he could hug him for them words so he cried and his wife she cried again, Pap said he'd been a man that had always been misunderstood before and the judge said he believed it. The old man said that what a man wanted that was down was sympathy and the judge said it was so so they cried again. And when it was bedtime the old man rose up and held out his hand and says, look at it, gentlemen and ladies all, take a hold of it, shake it. There's a hand that was the hand of a hog, but it ain't so no more, it's the hand of a man that started in on a new life and'll die before he'll go back. You mark them words don't forget I said them. 
It's a clean hand now, shake it, don't be afeard. So they shook it one after the other all around and cried. The judge's wife she kissed it. Then the old man he signed a pledge made his mark. The judge said it was the holiest time on record or something like that. Then they tucked the old man into a beautiful room which was the spare room and in the night some time he got powerful thirsty and clumb out onto the porch roof and slid down a stanchion and traded his new coat for a jug of forty rod and clumb back again and had a good old time and towards daylight he crawled out again, drunk as a fiddler and rolled off the porch and broke his left arm in two places and was most froze to death when somebody found him after sunup. And when they come to look at that spare room they had to take soundings before they could navigate it. The judge he felt kind of sore. He said he reckoned a body could reform the old man with a shotgun maybe but he didn't know no other way. Chapter 6 Well, pretty soon the old man was up and around again, and then he went for Judge Thatcher in the courts to make him give up that money, and he went for me too, for not stopping school. He catched me a couple of times and thrashed me, but I went to school just the same and dodged him or outrun him most of the time. I didn't want to go to school much before, but I reckoned I'd go now to spite pap. That law trial was a slow business, appeared like they weren't ever going to get started on it, so every now and then I'd borrow two or three dollars off of the judge for him, to keep from getting a cow hiding. Every time he got money he got drunk, and every time he got drunk he raised cane around town and every time he raised cane he got jailed. He was just suited this kind of thing was right in his line. He got to hanging around the widows too much and so she told him at last that if he didn't quit using around there she would make trouble for him. Well wasn't he mad? He said he would show who was Huck Finn's boss. So he watched out for me one day in the spring and catched me and took me up the river about three mile in a skiff and crossed over to the Illinois shore where it was woody and there weren't no houses but an old log hut in a place where the timber was so thick you couldn't find it if you didn't know where it was. He kept me with him all the time and I never got a chance to run off. We lived in that old cabin and he always locked the door and put the key under his head nights. He had a gun which he had stole, I reckon, and we fished and hunted, and that was what we lived on. Every little while he locked me in and went down to the store, three miles to the ferry, and traded fish and game for whiskey, and fetched it home and got drunk and had a good time, and licked me. The widow she found out where I was by and by, and she sent a man over to try to get hold of me, but Pap drove him off with the gun, and it weren't long after that till I was used to being where I was, and liked it, all but the cowhide part. It was kind of lazy and jolly laying off comfortable all day smoking and fishing and no books nor study. Two months or more run along and my clothes got to be all rags and dirt and I didn't see how I'd ever got to like it so well at the widow's where you had to wash and eat on a plate and comb up and go to bed and get up regular and be forever bothering over a book and have old Miss Watson pecking at you all the time. I didn't want to go back no more. I had stopped cussing because the widow didn't like it but now I took to it again because pap hadn't no objections. It was pretty good times up in the woods there, take it all around. But by and by pap got too handy with his hickry and I couldn't stand it. I was all over welts. He got to going away so much too and locking me in. Once he locked me in and was gone three days. It was dreadful lonesome. I judged he had got drowned and I wasn't ever going to get out any more. I was scared. I made up my mind I would fix up some way to leave there. I had tried to get out of that cabin many a time but I couldn't find no way. There weren't a window to it big enough for a dog to get through. I couldn't get up the chimbley it was too narrow. The door was thick solid oak slabs. Pap was pretty careful not to leave a knife or anything in the cabin when he was away, I reckon I had hunted the place over as much as a hundred times, well I was most all the time at it, because it was about the only way to put in the time. But this time I found something at last, I found an old rusty wood saw without any handle, it was laid in between a rafter and the clabbards of the roof. I greased it up and went to work. 
There was an old horse blanket nailed against the logs at the far end of the cabin behind the table to keep the wind from blowing through the chinks and putting the candle out. I got under the table and raised the blanket and went to work to saw a section of the big bottom log out, big enough to let me through. Well it was a good long job but I was getting towards the end of it when I heard Pap's gun in the woods. I got rid of the signs of my work and dropped the blanket and hid my saw and pretty soon Pap come in. Pap weren't in a good humor so he was his natural self. He said he was downtown and everything was going wrong. His lawyer said he reckoned he would win his lawsuit and get the money if they ever got started on the trial, but then there was ways to put it off a long time and Judge Thatcher knowed how to do it. And he said people allowed there'd be another trial to get me away from him and give me to the widow for my guardian and they guessed it would win this time. This shook me up considerable because I didn't want to go back to the widows anymore and be so cramped up and civilized as they called it. Then the old man got to cussing and cussed everything and everybody he could think of and then cussed them all over again to make sure he hadn't skipped any and after that he polished off with a kind of a general cuss all round, including a considerable parcel of people which he didn't know the names of and so called them what's his name when he got to them and went right along with his cussing. He said he would like to see the widow get me. He said he would watch out and if they tried to come any such game on him he knowed of a place six or seven mile off to stow me in where they might hunt till they dropped and they couldn't find me. That made me pretty uneasy again but only for a minute I reckoned I wouldn't stay on hand till he got that chance. The old man made me go to the skiff and fetch the things he had got. There was a 50-pound sack of cornmeal and a side of bacon, ammunition, and a four-gallon jug of whiskey, and an old book and two newspapers for wadding, besides some tow. I towed it up a load and went back and sat down on the bow of the skiff to rest. I thought it all over and I reckoned I would walk off with the gun and some lines and take to the woods when I run away. I guessed I wouldn't stay in one place but just tramp right across the country mostly night times and hunt and fish to keep alive and so get so far away that the old man nor the widow couldn't ever find me anymore. I judged I would saw out and leave that night if Pap got drunk enough and I reckoned he would. I got so full of it I didn't notice how long I was staying till the old man hollered and asked me whether I was asleep or drowned dead. I got the things all up to the cabin and then it was about dark. While I was cooking supper the old man took a swig or two and got sort of warmed up and went to ripping again. He had been drunk over in town and laid in the gutter all night and he was a sight to look at. A body would have thought he was Adam, he was just all mud. Whenever his liquor begun to work he most always went for the government, this time he says, call this a government. Why just look at it and see what it's like. Here's the law a standing ready to take a man's son away from him a man's own son which he has had all the trouble and all the anxiety and all the expense of raising. Yes, just as that man has got that son raised at last and ready to go to work and begin to do suthin for him and give him a rest, the law up and goes for him. And they call that government. That ain't all nuther. The law backs that old judge Thatcher up and helps him to keep me out oh my property. Here's what the law does, the law takes a man worth $6,000 and upards and jams him into an old trap of a cabin like this and lets him go round in clothes that ain't fitten for a hog. They call that government. A man can't get his rights in a government like this. Sometimes I've a mighty notion to just leave the country for good and all. Yes and I told em so, I told old Thatcher so to his face. Lots of em heard me and can tell what I said. Says I for two cents I'd leave the blamed country and never. Come a near it again. Them's the very words. I says look at my hat if you call it a hat but the lid raises up and the rest of it goes down till it's below my chin and then it ain't rightly a hat at all but more like my head was shoved up through a gint o stovepipe. Look at it says I such a hat for me to wear one of the wealthiest men in this town if I could get my rights. Oh yes, this is a wonderful government, wonderful. Why looky here. There was a free nigger there from Ohio, a mulatter, most as white as a white man. 
He had the whitest shirt on you ever see, too, and the shiniest hat, and there ain't a man in that town that's got as fine clothes as what he had, and he had a gold watch and chain, and a silver-headed cane, the awfulest old grey-headed nabob in the state. And what do you think? They said he was a professor in a college and could talk all kinds of languages and knowed everything. And that ain't the wust. They said he could vote when he was at home. Well that let me out. Thinks I what is the country a coming to? It was election day and I was just about to go and vote myself if I weren't too drunk to get there, but when they told me there was a state in this country where they'd let that nigger vote I drawed out. I says I'll never vote again. Them's the very words I said, they all heard me and the country may rot for all me, I'll never vote again as long as I live. And to see the cool way of that nigger why he wouldn't a give me the road if I hadn't shoved him out o oh, the way. I says to the people why ain't this nigger put up at auction and sold, that's what I want to know. And what do you reckon they said? Why they said he couldn't be sold till he'd been in the state six months and he hadn't been there that long yet. There now that's a specimen. They call that a government that can't sell a free nigger till he's been in the state six months. Here's a government that calls itself a government and lets on to be a government and thinks it is a government and yet's got to set stock still for six whole months before it can take a hold of a prowling, thieving, infernal, white shirt free nigger and pap was a going on so he never noticed where his old limber legs was taking him to so he went head over heels over the tub of salt pork and barked both shins. And the rest of his speech was all the hottest kind of language mostly hove at the nigger. And the government though he give the tub some, too, all along, here and there. He hopped around the cabin considerable, first on one leg and then on the other, holding first one shin and then the other one, and at last he let out with his left foot all of a sudden and fetched the tub a rattling kick. But it weren't good judgment, because that was the boot that had a couple of his toes leaking out of the front end of it, so now he raised a howl that fairly made a body's hair raise, and down he went in the dirt and rolled there and held his toes, and the cussing he'd done then laid over anything he had ever done previous. He said so his own self afterwards. He had heard old Soberry Hagen in his best days, and he said it laid over him, too, but I reckon that was sort of piling it on, maybe. After supper Pap took the jug and said he had enough whiskey there for two drunks and one delirium tremens. That was always his word. I judged he would be blind drunk in about an hour and then I would steal the key or saw myself out, one or t'other. He drank and drank and tumbled down on his blankets by and by but luck didn't run my way. He didn't go sound asleep but was uneasy. He groaned and moaned and thrashed around this way and that for a long time. At last I got so sleepy I couldn't keep my eyes open all I could do, and so before I knowed what I was about I was sound asleep and the candle burning. I don't know how long I was asleep, but all of a sudden there was an awful scream and I was up. There was Pap looking wild and skipping around every which way and yelling about snakes. He said they was crawling up his legs and then he would give a jump and scream and say one had bit him on the cheek, but I couldn't see no snakes. He started and run round and round the cabin hollering take him off. Take him off. He's biting me on the neck. I never see a man look so wild in the eyes. Pretty soon he was all faggied out and fell down panting, then he rolled over and over wonderful fast, kicking things every which way and striking and grabbing at the air with his hands and screaming and saying there was devils a hold of him. He wore out by and by and laid still a while moaning. Then he laid stiller and didn't make a sound. I could hear the owls and the wolves away off in the woods and it seemed terrible still. He was laying over by the corner. By and by he raised up part way and listened with his head to one side. He says very low, tramp tramp tramp, that's the dead, tramp tramp tramp, they're coming after me but I won't go. Oh they're here. Don't touch me don't. Hands off they're cold let go. Oh, let a poor devil alone. Then he went down on all fours and crawled off, begging them to let him alone, and he rolled himself up in his blanket and wallowed in under the old pine table, still a begging, and then he went to crying. I could hear him through the blanket. By and by he rolled out and jumped up on his feet looking wild and he see me and went for me. 
He chased me round and round the place with a clasp knife, calling me the angel of death, and saying he would kill me, and then I couldn't come for him no more. I begged and told him I was only Huck, but he laughed such a screechy laugh, and roared and cussed, and kept on chasing me up. Once when I turned short and dodged under his arm he made a grab and got me by the jacket between my shoulders and I thought I was gone, but I slid out of the jacket quick as lightning and saved myself. Pretty soon he was all tired out and dropped down with his back against the door and said he would rest a minute and then kill me. He put his knife under him and said he would sleep and get strong and then he would see who was who. So he dozed off pretty soon. By and by I got the old split bottom chair and clum up as easy as I could not to make any noise and got down the gun. I slipped the ramrod down it to make sure it was loaded, then I laid it across the turnip barrel, pointing towards Pap, and sat down behind it to wait for him to stir. And how slow and still the time did drag along. Chapter 7 Get up! What you bout? I opened my eyes and looked around trying to make out where I was. It was after sunup and I had been sound asleep. Pap was standing over me looking sour and sick too. He says, what you doing with this gun? I judged he didn't know nothing about what he had been doing so I says, somebody tried to get in so I was laying for him. Why didn't you rouse me out? Well I tried to but I couldn't, I couldn't budge you. Well alright. Don't stand there palavering all day but out with you and see if there's a fish on the lines for breakfast. I'll be along in a minute. He unlocked the door and I cleared out up the river bank. I noticed some pieces of limbs and such things floating down and a sprinkling of bark so I know the river had begun to rise. I reckoned I would have great times now if I was over at the town. The June rise used to be always luck for me because as soon as that rise begins here comes cordwood floating down and pieces of log rafts sometimes a dozen logs together so all you have to do is to catch them and sell them to the woodyards and the sawmill. I went along up the bank with one eye out for pap and t'other one out for what? The rise might fetch along. Well all at once here comes a canoe, just a beauty, too, about thirteen or fourteen foot long, riding high like a duck. I shot headfirst off of the bank like a frog, clothes and all on, and struck out for the canoe. I just expected there'd be somebody laying down in it, because people often done that to fool folks, and when a chap had pulled a skiff out most to it they'd raise up and laugh at him. But it weren't so this time. It was a drift canoe sure enough and I clum in and paddled her ashore. Thinks I the old man will be glad when he sees this she's worth ten dollars. But when I got to shore Pap wasn't in sight yet and as I was running her into a little creek like a gully, all hung over with vines and willows, I struck another idea, I judged I'd hide her good and then, instead of taking to the woods when I run off, I'd go down the river about 50 mile and camp in one place for good and not have such a rough time tramping on foot. It was pretty close to the shanty and I thought I heard the old man coming all the time, but I got her hid and then I out and looked around a bunch of willows, and there was the old man down the path a piece just drawing a bead on a bird with his gun. So he hadn't seen anything. When he got along I was hard at it taking up a itrat a line. He abused me a little for being so slow but I told him I fell in the river and that was what made me so long. I knowed he would see I was wet and then he would be asking questions. We got five catfish off the lines and went home. While we laid off after breakfast to sleep up, both of us being about wore out, I got to thinking that if I could fix up some way to keep Pap and the widow from trying to follow me, it would be a certainer thing than trusting to luck to get far enough off before they missed me, you see, all kinds of things might happen. Well I didn't see no way for a while, but by and by Pap raised up a minute to drink another barrel of water and he says, another time a man comes a prowling round here you roused me out, you hear? That man weren't here for no good. I'd a shot him. Next time you roused me. Out you hear? Then he dropped down and went to sleep again, but what he had been saying give me the very idea I wanted. I says to myself I can fix it now so nobody won't think of following me. About 12 o'clock we turned out and went along up the bank. The river was coming up pretty fast and lots of driftwood going by on the rise. 
By and by along comes part of a log raft, nine logs fast together. We went out with the skiff and towed it ashore. Then we had dinner. Anybody but Pap would have waited and seen the day through so as to catch more stuff, but that weren't Pap's style. Nine logs was enough for one time, he must shove right over to town and sell. So he locked me in and took the skiff and started off towing the raft about half past three. I judged he wouldn't come back that night. I waited till I reckoned he had got a good start, then I out with my saw and went to work on that log again. Before he was t'other side of the river I was out of the hole, him and his raft was just a speck on the water away off yonder. I took the sack of cornmeal and took it to where the canoe was hid and shoved the vines and branches apart and put it in, then I done the same with the side of bacon, then the whiskey jug. I took all the coffee and sugar there was, and all the ammunition, I took the wadding, I took the bucket and gourd, I took a dipper and a tin cup, and my old saw and two blankets, and the skillet and the coffee pot. I took fish lines and matches and other things, everything that was worth a cent. I cleaned out the place. I wanted an axe, but there wasn't any, only the one out at the woodpile and I knowed why I was going to leave that. I fetched out the gun and now I was done. I had wore the ground a good deal crawling out of the hole and dragging out so many things. So I fixed that as good as I could from the outside by scattering dust on the place which covered up the smoothness and the sawdust. Then I fixed the piece of log back into its place and put two rocks under it and one against it to hold it there for it was bent up at that place and didn't quite touch ground. If you stood four or five foot away and didn't know it was sawed you wouldn't never notice it, and besides this was the back of the cabin and it weren't likely anybody would go fooling around there. It was all grass clear to the canoe so I hadn't left a track. I followed around to see. I stood on the bank and looked out over the river. All safe. So I took the gun and went up a piece into the woods and was hunting around for some birds when I see a wild pig, hogs soon went wild in them bottoms after they had got away from the prairie farms. I shot this fellow and took him into camp. I took the axe and smashed in the door. I beat it and hacked it considerable a doing it. I fetched the pig in and took him back nearly to the table and hacked into his throat with the axe and laid him down on the ground to bleed I say ground because it was ground hard packed and no boards. Well next I took an old sack and put a lot of big rocks in it all I could drag and I started it from the pig and dragged it to the door and threw the woods down to the river and dumped it in and down it sunk out of sight. You could easy see that something had been dragged over the ground. I did wish Tom Sawyer was there I knowed he would take an interest in this kind of business and throw in the fancy touches. Nobody could spread himself like Tom Sawyer in such a thing as that. Well last I pulled out some of my hair and blooded the axe good and stuck it on the backside and slung the axe in the corner. Then I took up the pig and held him to my breast with my jacket so he couldn't drip till I got a good piece below the house and then dumped him into the river. Now I thought of something else. So I went and got the bag of meal and my old saw out of the canoe and fetched them to the house. I took the bag to where it used to stand and ripped a hole in the bottom of it with the saw for there weren't no knives and forks on the place, Pat done everything with his clasp knife about the cooking. Then I carried the sack about a hundred yards across the grass and through the willows east of the house, to a shallow lake that was five mile wide and full of rushes, and ducks too, you might say, in the season. There was a slough or a creek leading out of it on the other side that went miles away, I don't know where, but it didn't go to the river. The meal sifted out and made a little track all the way to the lake. I dropped Pap's whetstone there too so as to look like it had been done by accident. Then I tied up the rip in the meal sack with a string so it wouldn't leak no more and took it and my saw to the canoe again. It was about dark now so I dropped the canoe down the river under some willows that hung over the bank and waited for the moon to rise. I made fast to a willow then I took a bite to eat and by and by laid down in the canoe too. Smoke a pipe and lay out a plan. I says to myself they'll follow the track of that sack full of rocks to the shore and then drag the river for me. And they'll follow that meal track to the lake and go browsing down the creek that leads out of it to find the robbers that killed me and took the things. 
They won't ever hunt the river for anything but my dead carcass. They'll soon get tired of that and won't bother no more about me. All right, I can stop anywhere I want to. Jackson's Island is good enough for me, I know that island pretty well and nobody ever comes there. And then I can paddle over to town nights and slink around and pick up things I want. Jackson's Island's the place. I was pretty tired and the first thing I knowed I was asleep. When I woke up I didn't know where I was for a minute. I sat up and looked around a little scared. Then I remembered. The river looked miles and miles across. The moon was so bright I could accounted the drift logs that went a slipping along, black and still, hundreds of yards out from shore. Everything was dead quiet and it looked late and smelt late. You know what I mean, I don't know the words to put it in. I took a good gap and a stretch and was just going to unhitch and start when I heard a sound away over the water. I listened. Pretty soon I made it out. It was that dull kind of a regular sound that comes from oars working in rowlocks when it's a still night. I peeped out through the willow branches and there it was a skiff away across the water. I couldn't tell how many was in it. It kept a coming and when it was abreast of me I see there warn't but one man in it. Thinks I maybe it's pap though I warn't expecting him. He dropped below me with the current and by and by he came a swinging up shore in the easy water and he went by so close I could a reached out the gun and touched him. Well it was pap sure enough and sober too by the way he laid his oars. I didn't lose no time. The next minute I was a spinning downstream soft but quick in the shade of the bank. I made two mile and a half and then struck out a quarter of a mile or more towards the middle of the river because pretty soon I would be passing the ferry landing and people might see me and hail me. I got out amongst the driftwood and then laid down in the bottom of the canoe and let her float. I laid there and had a good rest and a smoke out of my pipe looking away into the sky not a cloud in it. The sky looks ever so deep when you lay down on your back in the moonshine I never knowed it before and how far a body can hear on the water such nights. I heard people talking at the ferry landing. I heard what they said too, every word of it. One man said it was getting towards the long days and the short nights now. T'other one said this weren't one of the short ones, he reckoned and then they laughed and he said it over again and they laughed again, then they waked up another fellow and told him and laughed, but he didn't laugh, he ripped out something brisk and said let him alone. The first fellow said he load to tell it to his old woman she would think it was pretty good, but he said that weren't nothing to some things he had said in his time. I heard one man say it was nearly three o'clock and he hoped daylight wouldn't wait more than about a week longer. After that the talk got further and further away and I couldn't make out the words anymore, but I could hear the mumble and now and then a laugh too but it seemed a long ways off. I was away below the ferry now. I rose up and there was Jackson's Island about two mile and a half downstream heavy timbered and standing up out of the middle of the river big and dark and solid like a steamboat without any lights. There weren't any signs of the bar at the head it was all underwater now. It didn't take me long to get there. I shot past the head at a ripping rate the current was so swift and then I got into the dead water and landed on the side towards the Illinois shore. I run the canoe into a deep dent in the bank that I knowed about, I had to part the willow branches to get in and when I made fast nobody could a seen the canoe from the outside. I went up and sat down on a log at the head of the island and looked out on the big river and the black driftwood and away over to the town, three mile away, where there was three or four lights twinkling. A monstrous big lumber raft was about a mile upstream coming along down with a lantern in the middle of it. I watched it come creeping down and when it was most abreast of where I stood I heard a man say, stern oars, there. Heave her head to starboard. I heard that just as plain as if the man was by my side. There was a little grey in the sky now so I stepped into the woods and laid down for a nap before breakfast.